Hello gardeners and welcome to the show. This is Mid-American Gardener and we are very glad that you have joined us because we're gonna talk about things that are happening right now. So I have three folks with me who are very great in their area and we will be answering some of your questions. Hi, I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois and so my areas of expertise are cut flowers and perennials in the landscape. But let's find out who else is here and you can direct your calls and your questions towards their area of expertise, please. Thank you. All right, let's start first with you, Mike Brunk. Hi, I'm the city arborist for Urbana, Illinois, and I'll know a little bit about trees and maybe some things about landscape recycling and maybe a few things about turf and perennials, but really trees are my specialty. Excellent. What is your email? What have you got for us first or show and tell? Okay, let's go with the show and tell. We have completed a uh, revised version of our Under the Canopy publication. And if you don't know what that is, it's a publication that we created with a number of arborists around the state uh, to help guide people on selecting and choosing trees and caring for trees around one's home. So in the guide, we have such things as uh, planning your landscape and uh, what seasons you should think about. Uh, the seasonal interest of trees, soil types, uh, sunlight, characteristics when you are looking to choose your tree. It also talks about sp proper spacing, things to avoid, and we list some trees that uh, we would like to see more of. We talk about planting and pruning trees and just about everything you'd want to know. And then what we've done is we've gotten an artist to render, color render, uh, the trees that we are uh, suggesting as good trees to consider. So it's uh, uh, everything you need to know about trees around, around one's home kind of publication and it's been very popular so we created a second edition and we added some new trees to that. And how might they get those? Oh well I brought a case in <laughs> uh, for the studio so uh, certainly uh, they can uh, acquire one from uh, WILL uh, also, you should contact your local extension because many extensions have copies too. It's an excellent, just an excellent brochure. The first one, and I'm sure the second one, I have to look at it because it's so brand new. Thank you for bringing those in and Welcome. chatting about it. Sure. Well then let's move to the lady in the middle, <laughs> Kay Carnes. Hi, I'm Kay Carnes. I'm a Champaign County Master Gardener and my areas of expertise are herbs, uh, heirloom vegetables, seed saving, and a few perennials, enough to be dangerous. <laughs> um, and I brought today, um, this is a summer squash. It's called Gagat Passon, and Passon means patty pan. So this is a patty pan squash. Um, it's not scalloped as much as some of the others, but it's a very nice squash. It, it grows in a bush, and I'm gonna cut it open because what I really like about it is the flesh. Um, you would use this um, in this stage like you would a zucchini, but the flesh is very white, mm. and um, it doesn't have a very big seed cavity no. at all. So it's, it's almost all flesh, and it's got a really nice flavor to it. Um, so it's my new favorite this year. And um, you can, it's an heirloom, it's a French heirloom, and there are places you can get the seed from. Is that the best size, or can you pick them smaller or uh, bigger? You can pick them smaller. Okay. Um, I know that when they're really small, they can them okay. in France or, or pickle them, um, but I've not done that. I, but this size <clears throat> or smaller yes. or even bigger, I've got some that are, are much are bigger than this. Um, so it's, it's a well, really nice. Well, that's a nice one, so meaty. They are, I, you know, I made a recipe of, of zucchini bread and I needed three cups of shredded zucchini and I you didn't even use a whole one. That's how wow. meaty they are. Very good. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. Thanks so much for bringing that in. We like seeing new vegetables to try out for the next <laughs> year. Actually, you could try it out this year. Yes. If you got the seed Yeah, yeah you could. Mm -hmm. Okay. And well, then let's. You wouldn't have squash bugs. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, segueing into insects, that was very good, Kim. Right yeah. <laughs> let's go to uh, our doctor pest, I mean, our entomologist, <laughs> Dr. Jim Appleby. Hi, Jim. Hi, Diane. Well, I am an entomologist in the uh, University of Illinois. I'm in the Department of Natural Resources and Environmental Studies. And, uh, 
You know, one of my hobbies is water gardening. So what I've done is uh, written up my ideas about water gardening. I made this leaflet, and you can obtain this leaflet by calling 217-333-2770 and just ask for this uh, leaflet on water gardening. Now in water gardening, we have several different uh, kinds of water lilies. You have the hardy water lilies, which means that you have to uh, uh, bring those, uh, you, you can let those outside all the time. And then the other kind is a tropical water lily, which means that you have to bring those in or simply purchase a uh, plant every, every year. So let's take a look at some of these uh, be beautiful water lilies. Uh, this first one is called James Bride, and it's a bright red, very hardy, does extremely well here in the Midwest. Then this next one we'll show is, um, is called Joy Tomchick. And that's a really, really nice cream-colored lily. It does extremely well, produces very large blooms during the, uh, the summer months. It's a hardy water lily like James Bryden. And then the next one is, is Virgin Alice. And of the whites, this is run that's really, really nice. There's many different kinds of varieties of white ones, but Virgin Alice is really an outstanding variety. Beautiful uh, blooms. And then the next one we have is called um, jo Rose Ari, Rose Ari, and that's a nice pink. The blooms are not real large, but it's very uh, abundant of blooms that it produces. And then the next one is um, is Colorado. Now, if you're going to purchase a water lily, this is one I really, really recommend. It's absolutely a stunning lily. It does very, very well, produces a large number of blues during the summer months. So if you're going to get one lily, get Colorado. And then the next one is a, um, is a tropical lily. And this is Emily Grant Hutchkins, and this is a night bloomer. Now, people often say, well, why in the world would you want to purchase a a water lily that blooms at night. But let's face it, most of us entertain at night or in the evening. So this, if you get a water lily that blooms in the evening, this starts opening up about seven in the evening, and then it's open all night, and then it closes about nine the following morning. So your guests arrive, they're gonna see something. Whereas the hardy lilies, they all close up about three in the afternoon, so they don't, you know, people don't see them. So you can really advertise your water lily by have a, a night bloomer. Then this last one is another hardy water lily, and this is Panama Pacific. This is a day bloomer, so you can have tropicals that also bloom in the daytime. So if you want this uh, leaflet, uh, just like a, an indication there, you can call 217-333-2770 and ask for this leaflet on the water garden. But it gives you some other tips, you know, that you may not find other places. Very good, and you can Mix and match. If you know people who have another kind, you can divide. Sure, we all do that. Have multiple colors. We all do that. Thank you for that nice primer on water lilies. Very good. Well, I want to say hello to all the folks who went on the WILL Mid American Gardener Germany trip. And we had a great time. We just got back and we saw castle gardens. We saw castles, castle gardens, university gardens, and private gardens. And here's um, one of the um, pictures of a castle at Heidelberg and the folks who were on the trip with me. So we had a, a great time. It was great getting to know everyone on that trip. And now we're trying to rest up. <laughs> okay. Well, we thank um, each of you who went. And if you see a WILL trip you like, sign up for it. Let's go next to the special Did You Know? The oil inside a banana peel will reduce the itching and inflammation from a mosquito bite. So if you get a bug bite, try rubbing a banana peel on it. You learn something every day, don't yeah. you? I thought that was interesting. Okay, let's go to the callers next, and we're going to start with line two. And Peggy has a question about boxwood. Hi, Peggy. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I have a boxwood. It's about 12 years old. It's about three to four foot across, or about three foot tall and about three foot around. And I'm going to have to move it. How much dirt do I need to take out in order to be able to move that tree, or is that too old to move? 
I'll get off here, hang up, and hear what you have to say. Thank you very much. You have a blessed day. Thank you. So three foot high boxwood. How much soil does she need? Mm -hmm. Generally, um, I would think that you're going to want to, on um, the shrub, dig the soil uh, uh, to the diameter of the shrub uh, as best you can. I don't think three feet would be, well, that would be uh, fairly large. Um, so uh, on a tree, I know it's a foot for every diameter inch and trunk, but on a shrub, it's a little different. And um, you're really going to have to kind of feel it out to how big a ball you can move out of that hole because you get a two foot ball uh, that you're going to go about 18, 16 to 18 inches deep. It's going to be quite heavy, so you're going to have to, to kind of burlap that as you go and see if you can roll it out of the hole. But that's a good question. I, I can't answer that exactly on a shrub. Uh, um, as she far could as do diameter. some root pruning in fall and move it in spring. You know, that would help get s smaller root system going. Well, that's a very good idea. They, it's kind of air pruning itself uh, mm -hmm. when you do that, and you grow new roots in the, uh, enable on the, uh, closer into the shrub so you can move it with a more vigorous root system. But probably move it in spring, don't you think, for boxwood? They, uh, yes, I, I think they, it's safest to move most woodies in the spring. They time. would have a difficult time, I think. Um, well, in the heat now and then going into winter. So anyway, good question, Peggy. So hopefully you have good luck with the um, boxwood moving. Well, we're going to move on to Dwight's question on line three, and it's a lawn question. Hi, Dwight. Good evening. Hi. Uh, I have a question on uh, about uh, nimbleweed. Uh, I understand. I've got about, uh, not just in the small path, but I'm, it seemed to be a very aggressive uh, type of uh, grass. And I, I have tr I've tried to uh, kill it with Roundup and things like this. And no, So uh, you had no luck with Roundup? Hi there, Dwight. Did we lose yes. you? Talk to us. <laughs> What's your question? I guess he wants to know how to get rid of it. I can't believe that Roundup wouldn't work. So anyway, what, what do you have for him on nimble weed in lawns? Nimble will would be Roundup Nim is what I would suggest to use on, is it nimble will? Is it nimble will? I think it, I say nimble weed, but I think it's nimble will. Um, uh, certainly trying to dig it out would be good, but Roundup should work and, and it could be not, not really, uh, getting it all when he sprays. So you may want to spray a little bit outside the area where you have the nimble will. It's easily identified in early spring because it doesn't green up as fast as the, the turf, but you're going to want to wait till it's actively growing in order to, to uh, get it to, uh, to get the Roundup to work. In fact, you wouldn't want to treat it in the heat of the summer either. So when it's actively growing after a good rain, and the sun comes out and it's dry, that would be a good time to, mm -hmm. to treat it. But maybe try to treat a little beyond where the nimble will patch is to ensure you're getting it all. And it's not going to be pretty after a while, but that's You know, I had um, to work. Creeping Charlie in my yard, <laughs> and uh, I had bluegrass and, the, and a lot of dogs, so uh, we were going to change the yard out anyhow, but I just round up the whole yard, and I started over with fescue. And it may be if you have enough nimble will that you might consider just starting over and, and treating your entire yard. And, and then the I just used a sod cutter to uh, remove the old dead grass and I seeded. Seeded the new fescues. Seeded the new the fescues tolerant. in September. Okay. That's an ideal time to seed new grass. Well, that's an idea for Dwight. So thank you for your question. Now let's move on to Barbara's question on line four and it's about a hackberry. Hi, Barbara. Hello. How are you? Doing great. What's your question? Um, I have a little bit of a long story. Um, I had a hackberry tree, a beautiful hackberry tree. Always brought the migrant birds to it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I had a fire, and we had to remove the hackberry tree. Recently, I found a shrub, and I didn't know what it was until I decided it must be a hackberry gr growing. So what I need to know is how do I trim it so it grows back to be a tree? Okay. Excellent timing. This is a good question. That is a good question. So you're going to want to pick the strongest branch. Yes. 
yes. and start to remove the lower branches. Yes. Uh, you don't want to remove them all at once because the lower branches will help create the diameter and the stoutness of the, the main branch. But you're going to want to just little by little, year by year, slowly uh, raise the, the lower branches, remove the lower branches so you can graze the crown of the tree. But start by picking the strongest branch and removing a lot of the other suckers that are coming up from the ground. Uh, you may start out by uh, keeping three or four of the main suckers coming out of the ground to see which one might be the strongest. But eventually you're going to want to remove them all but one. And these, these are the little suckers that are coming out of the ground. And when you have that one, you're going to want to start to slowly train it. And I wouldn't try to do it all at once, but just little by little, removing no more than 25% of the foliage in a given season would be a good guideline. Okay, very good question, and it happens. So hopefully lots of viewers will get some good ideas. Well, we have a Prairie Fire crab apple question next uh, from Nancy on line five. Hi, Nancy. Hi there. What's your question? My question is, we had, our tree had crab scab at one time, about three years ago. We've had to have it sprayed twice a year since. This is getting a little bit expensive, so I am just wondering, is it necessary to have it sprayed every year? If you don't want it to defoliate, yes. Okay. Okay, well, it, it does. It gets a little bit expensive every year to do it. I love the tree, but I'm just thinking about maybe going ahead and having it taken down. Well, I think that's a viable option when you have a crab apple that's infected with scab. There are crab apples that are resistant to the problem, but you may consider uh, replacing the tree with something that's um, more disease resistant. I think that's a good option. Hmm. You know, I haven't had, does Prairie Fire as a... Well, I, 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 not that I'm aware of, is, Prairie Fire is supposed to be scab resistant. I haven't seen it in our Prairie Fire. We don't see it at school yeah, and I don't have it at home. Yeah. Well, that's interesting because when we bought it, we were told it was a furry fire. Well, so now does, I don't know. does does the foliage come out maroon colored? Yes, and okay. it has a really carmine, really beautiful bright red fruit, bright pinkish flower. Uh, it, yes, it has a bright pink, not red. But that's correct. Mm -hmm. The fruit's red, isn't it? The fruit is red. Yes. Well, I think that's what you've got. Hmm. Well, Could, that's interesting. And also, the, the little suckers that come up from the trunk yes. that have to be cut down all the time. Yes. Is there any way of getting rid of those permanently? You know, the, I've, I haven't experimented with this much, but um, uh, an arborist that I admire told me at one time that if you can get carefully get down to the root where the sucker's coming off of and try to trim it uh, right at the root, that that helps minimize its regrowth. But uh, those are a real hassle. I understand trying to keep the suckers, linden trees do the same thing and it's very hard to uh, keep them from coming back year to year. In fact, it's practically impossible. It usually means the tree is stressed to some degree. So if it's in poor soil uh, or it's being nicked with a string trimmer or there's girdling roots, Generally, when you see a tree suckering at the base like that, it's stressed somehow. Interesting. Well, very good question. Thank you so much. Uh, let's go to one before we go back to some emails. Uh, Kathy's question on line two, and it's about a follow-up, I think, on the banana peel. Hi, Kathy. <laughs> yes, it is. Uh, we heard you say it, and I get mosquito bites all the time. And I was wondering, do you use the inside skin of the banana or the outside of the skin? I believe I it was outside or inside. I think it's the inside. I think, it's the inside. Oh, I think so. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. It was sent I in. I was the voice, but it was sent in from oh, some okay. of the panel. So it's worth trying, though. But I believe it's the inside. Okay. So hopefully that I I have I can say I haven't tried it, but now I will. We I find try that it. Alo really takes itch out quickly of any insect bite. So if you have yeah, aloe vera, if you, yeah, if you have that. Uh, if you have so if you do anything. have, if you do get bit, <coughs> use the aloe but vera. Most people have bananas too. <laughs> but that, I think that's why that was sent in because mm -hmm. a lot of people have bananas. So thank you, Kathy. Now let's do um, a quick email round. So we'll go back to you, Mike. Okay, well I've got a uh, email that's looking for tree suggestions. This gentleman's 
has a house that's baked in the sun and bombarded, bom bom bombarded at night by lights from a baseball stadium across the street. He has blocked that with ornamental pears, one of which fell on his house in a heavy snow. Uh, and then he replaced it with another Bradford pair that's slightly different version. Um, and they uh, do have several versions of pears. Uh, but it's uh, now dropping its leaves early and has fire blight. So he's looking for uh, suggestions on replacing this tree. And my first thought is that Under the Canopy might be a good publication for you to uh, uh, access and look at some of the uh, possible trees in there. But I, I would say, you know, 15 feet from your house is fairly close, and to find a tree as dense as a Bradford pear is going to be a little tough. Um, but uh, you may think about uh, red buckeye, or uh, I've jotted down uh, several others, a carnelian cherry dogwood, lobner magnolia, sweet bay magnolia. These are all smaller trees. Now, they're not fast growers like the pear. Uh, black hall viburnum would be another one. Now, if you can move the tree out a little further from the house, say like 25 feet, then maybe you could open up the possibility of something like a, a State Street Maybe maple that's fairly dense and it's got a little uh, faster rate of growth, and or uh, Frontier Elm, uh, which has yet a faster rate rate of growth and it has a pretty fall uh, purple fall color. But they're a little bigger, so you wouldn't really want them uh, any closer than 20 or 25 feet. Okay, very good, good suggestions and unique trees too. All right, Kay. Okay, I have a question from a viewer that says, why do my broccoli plants have multiple heads and not one major head? Um, this is the second year this has happened. Um, I had never pr planted broccoli prior to 2014. Well, um, that can be a couple of things. Um, for one thing, sometimes not all varieties um, are um, good to plant in the spring, and so that'll um, you'll get multiple heads. Um, ironically, two of the ones I see most in garden centers, Pac-Man and Premium Crop, are two that actually are better planted in the fall. Um, so garden so centers need to get with yeah. it and not <laughs> offer them in the spring. Uh, and it could be some stress interesting. too. Um, you mm -hmm. know, if you planted it too late when it's hot, it might do that. But I would, you know, you can go ahead and use the, the little heads. They're just wonderful. And I grow, I actually grow sprouting broccoli mm -hmm. uh, rather than one that has a main head. So, uh, you know, go ahead and use them. It's and very tasty. Maybe try a different variety. Okay, or ask your garden center to grow a different variety yeah. <laughs> if that's what. You, but I don't mind the little heads either. No, because you know, when they regrow, they'll grow littler. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. And Jim, on to you. Well, we had a uh, email from Amanda Richardson from Edgar County, and she wanted to know what the insect was that she had on her windowsill, and um, the name of this is the black witch moth and it's our largest moth in the United States so and it's it's a tropical insect so that insect that moth probably came from Florida or maybe parts of Texas Wow! wow. but um, black witch and it's really rather unusual sometimes in the Caribbean they call it the money bat because it does look like a bat when it flies and it's supposed to bring good luck but then other other people not. think it's <laughs> death when you see the the black witch means there's death coming wow, so that was really it has a, different uh, meanings when you see this moth but it's our largest moth unique. in the united states well that was but good tropical getting some id from that one okay well let's go to our mid-american gardener quiz next <music> peonies are named after peon who was peon to the greek gods a carpenter B, physician, C, plumber, D, gardener. B, physician. Peon was a student of Asclepius, the Greek god of medicine and healing. After a while, Asclepius became very jealous of his pupil. Zeus saved Peon from Asclepius by turning him into a peony flower. Okay, with our little bit of time left, let's talk about some more 
tree or shrub suggestions? Well, you know, I was thinking about the boxwood as the show was moving along, and one thing we didn't talk about was it would be good to soak the area around the base of the boxwood before mm -hmm. she digs it. And, you know, probably somewhere in a diameter of 12 to 18 inches would be a sufficient size. But yeah. get the root ball good and soaked the day before you dig it, and that'll hold the soil better together. And provide a little easier time of getting it to uh, stay together. And That's a good suggestion. And then Jim, I want to follow up. Someone asked about what's the white stuff at the top of the purple cone flowers? Oh yeah, that was a plant uh, hopper. Uh, the lady described it as sort of a cottony mass, but it sort of looks all like, like frothy mass. But the nymphs cause that on many, many different plants. Cotton hopper. Thank you very it's much, Jim. Plant it's hopper. time to go, but we got a few things in. Thank you so much for watching. See you next week. Goodbye. Thank you.